Well, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this Macmillan webinar. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, my name's Robert Campbell, and I'm one of the authors of Beyond, the new international secondary course from Macmillan. Here it is. And my co-authors on the course are Rebecca Rob Benna and Rob Metcalf. And we're also co-presenting this webinar, which we've called First Classes and Beyond. So I'm going to begin by looking at those very first classes and how to get the school year off to a good start after, hol after the holidays. Then Rob and Rebecca will be looking beyond those first classes at how to get the most from your students throughout the whole school year. Now during the course of the webinar, we'll be showing you some practical ideas which you can try out with your students. Um, some of those will be from our course, but the ideas can be applied to any course book and most teaching situations. And one other thing, we'll be making the slides from this presentation available on the Macmillan website, so you don't have to copy anything from the slides. In fact, the whole webinar will be available online in case you want to recommend it to any of your colleagues or uh, in case you want to watch it again. Okay, so I want to start by asking you all a question. And if you could type your answer in the chat box, then that would be great. Here comes a question. Which country do you teach in and when does your school year start? Okay, England, September, Uruguay, March, Argentina, March, Japan, April. Any more? Hang on, my chat box has stopped scrolling. Oof. Well, there's a lot of variation there. I'm talking to you from, uh, from the Midland offices in London, and uh, the school year here uh, has just started. In Scotland, where I was the other day, it started last month. Uh, the same is true for Rebecca, uh, who's in Denmark, and uh, Rob in Barcelona is still looking after the kids because the school year hasn't started yet. So I'm going to... Uh, show you this, it's for teachers. Now this is a magazine that I used to produce in, uh, in Spain for teachers of English. And the September issue of the magazine was always the most popular issue of the year. Uh, teachers were always looking for ideas for first classes that were fun, quirky, and that would motivate their students and create a positive learning atmosphere at the beginning of the year. So I'm going to show you one of those activities now which I've adapted for this webinar. So if we were in the classroom, it would work like this. First of all, I'd, uh, I'd write some names on the board. OK. Here's another question. How many of these names do you recognize? One, two, or all three? Can you type the number in the box? OK, so some of you have got all three. OK, I'm going to add some more names now. These ones should be more familiar to you. Now, in the classroom, I'd ask you to tell me who the people are and find out which of the people you like. Then I'd explain that all of these names have been in the news over the last few months. Now, the names I've chosen here are quite popular names that are linked to music, sports, etc. But with more advanced students or older students, you could add some names related to slightly more serious news stories like these ones. So I wonder if you could uh, take a few seconds and, and just help me out and tell me why you think 
some of these names have been in the news over the last couple of months. Again, if you could type your answers in the chat box, that would be great. Ebola, the World Cup, politics, Robin Williams died, footballer of the year, Bill Gates. Okay, I could help you if I tell you all the names that are in blue are linked to one specific news story. Do you know which one that is? Okay, well thanks for all your suggestions. You'll see the answers in a moment. But if you go back to the classroom, after we talked about all the names and possible connections to news stories, I divide the class into two teams and give each team a piece of paper with some information about the news stories, but with the names missing. The students in their two teams would then complete their sentences using some of the names on the board. So here if I show you a sample sentences for team A, you can think which names would fit in those gaps. And here are the answers. Okay, and I'm going to show you team B. And here you can see what all those names in blue had in common, which was the famous ice bucket challenge. And now, I'd ask each team to prepare some questions based on the news stories. They could write these questions based on their own knowledge. For example, here for question one, they could write a question asking the other team to explain the rules of the ice bucket challenge. Or looking at question two, they could base their question on information uh, in the sentences. So for example, here they could ask a question about the film Guardians of the Galaxy. For example, which of these is not a character from Guardians of the Galaxy? Groot, Star-Lord, Gamora, or Loki? So when they got all their questions, the teams would take it in turns to ask each other their questions, getting points for correct questions and for correct answers. Now this is with intermediate level students. For lower level students, they could write fact cards with one or two facts about a name and then get another pair to guess and say the name. This activity works really well at the start of a new academic year and, and also at the start of a new calendar year in January when you can talk about new stories from the previous year. I like it a lot because A, it's fun. Uh, B, it's topical, which makes it different from anything in a course book. And C, it covers three things that are important to consider when preparing a first class activity. Sorry, we just heard a crash outside. There are some building works going on. Nobody's been hurt. So here are the three things. Respect students' knowledge and experience of the world. Encourage students to formulate their own opinions and ideas and activate students' prior linguistic knowledge and build on what they already know. These three things really help boost confidence and engagement and get students to recycle language. And Rob will be talking more about these principles in the second part of the webinar. Now, as I said before, we use the names and the news activity quite often in the magazine over the years. And while the magazine is taking a rest at the moment, a lot of the material is still out there and, uh, and you'll find some of it at One Stop English. Okay, here we're looking at the One Stop English page. Now out of interest, if you use the yes, no box, could you just tell me uh, how many of you are members of One Stop English or regularly use it? Yes or no? Wow, that's encouraging. That's almost all of you. 
Well, we're looking at the home page of One Stop English, and you'll see at the top there are the different tabs for the different sections of the site. And uh, we're going to look at the survival guide. Uh, there's also a link down in the left-hand corner there. And it has lots of interesting sections, which uh, here we go. For example, there's a teacher survival kit where you can find everything you need to, uh, to include to have access to in the classroom. But there's also a section here on first classes. And there you'll find more than 20 really easy to use activities. And this is just to give you a taste of the kind of activities you'll find there. So first of all, get to know your students. Now, if you're uh, teaching a new class, here you'll find some tips for remembering names. For example, uh, try to do activities in which students have to use each other's names as often as possible so you and they can get used to the different names. And actually, before, uh, before we started the, the webinar, Rob was telling me about one of his favorite activities, which is uh, the teacher writing a letter of introduction to new students with uh, missing information about you and your life. So in groups, students then prepare questions to ask you to try and find out what that information is and complete your letter. And then they can write their own letters about themselves. It works really well because the initial focus is on the teacher and not on the students. Uh, it can review grammar that you want to focus on. And it creates a nice personal link between the teacher and the students. Uh, we carry on down this list, uh, find out how much vocabulary they know. Even with beginner level students, uh, you can show them how much uh, vocabulary they already know by giving them categories and asking them to write as many words in English as they can for each category. And I think uh, they will be surprised at how much money they already, how much money, <laughs> how much vocabulary in English they already know. Uh, designing a class mascot is also a great idea for kids, but it also works for teenagers. Um, you could get your students into teams and get them to design a class mascot, and then the class votes on the one that they like best. And this is very useful for you for uh, later teaching. If you want to give examples, you can always refer to the class mascot instead of um, having to draw stick figures on the board or whatever. And finally, if your students are new to the school, you could write some true-false questions about the school, which they can only answer by exploring the school. So for example, you could say, the library is opposite class 21. Is that true or false? And send the students out to have a look. Now, Beyond, our course, also has a section at One Stop English. And uh, it's in the teens area. And there are lots of activities here, and more are being added all the time. I'd like to show you one of those activities, which is uh, fun to do at the beginning of the school year. It's in the knowledge section. OK, and this is called a class contract. And uh, you start off by giving the students a model contract. It's an agreement between the teacher and the students, dealing with, uh, with the things that each party agrees to do during the school year. And the, first of all, the students would look through this model contract and see which of the statements they agree with or disagree with. Then you would give them a blank contract and then small groups. And in small groups, they would draw up their own contract. And then the different groups would compare contracts until eventually they end up with a single contract for the class, which both the teacher and the students can sign. A lot of course books also include ideas for first classes. And uh, in the lower levels of beyond, uh, we included a starter unit, which is designed to be used in those first classes. Now, we used a comic, 
uh, to remind students of things they've already learned and as they read the comic they have to complete related games uh, and tasks. And in the same way as the students might have explored the school to find out more about the school, you can do the same with your course book. I think we often start the school year uh, using the course book without really introducing our students to it and showing off all its features. So again, you could use a quiz to help the students find their way around the book. Um, you could write true-false questions or set tasks as, uh, such as where can you find a list of irregular verbs or what is the words and beyond section for and what online resources are there for students. There's a lot to explore in a course book. So that brings us to the end of uh, the first section of the webinar. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm going to pass you over to Rob, who's in Barcelona and who's going to take you through the next section. Rob, over to you. Thank you, Robert. Well, a warm welcome to you from, from Barcelona, where it is warm and maybe a little bit too humid. Can I just check you can all uh, see and hear me? I look a bit stuttery on my own video camera, so I'm a tiny bit worried about that. Can you, can you hear me, at least? No answer there, but I'll assume you can. <laughs> And the second part of our webinar is called Activate and Engage. And we're going to look at how those three principles behind Robert's first class activities can help students get the most from their lessons throughout the school year. Let's return to activating students' prior knowledge, their linguistic knowledge, but also their knowledge of the world and their experiences. The idea here is to use leading activities before starting a lesson or a new activity. It can be hard to make time for leading activities, but it's really worth it. While researching beyond, we visited a lot of classes in different parts of the world, and we noticed that when leading activities were used, it seemed to really help all students concentrate on what came next. In fact, we were so struck by this that we decided to include a leading activity in every lesson in, in Beyond and to start every unit with a recall section. Here's just an example of what I mean by that. This is from uh, an A2 plus level wait, uh, activity on uh, a unit on work. So I got confused with the slides there on work. And I just zoom on, on the lead in activity there so you can see it. Is the tiger. The activity works with visuals, but if you don't have visuals, it's very easy to improvise activities like this where students classify act, uh, vocabulary they already know by, um, you could use an example like this one, for example, on food. And the great thing about activities like this is that, firstly, they remind students how much they already know, which is something Robert looked at but they prepare them for adding to that knowledge. They also allow you to see what students already know, especially if you're working with a new group. And uh, this allows you to give help where it's needed most, rather than teaching them things that, that they already know. Not only that, they also allow everybody in the class to make a positive contribution, so that has a, a, an impact on differentiation in your classes. But leading activities, don't just activate linguistic knowledge, they also play an important role in activating students' knowledge of the world and their experiences. For example, let's say students are going to read about fragrances, which is, what, which is a topic we've covered in one of our, one of our levels. Let's we'll just wait for that. Let's take a look at that. A good leading activity to activate knowledge of the topic will get students to talk about fragrances. So you can see the first activity on the, on the, um, on the screen there. Which, per which perfumes and fragrances can you name? What different types of products use fragrances? That's quite a generative idea, you know. Fragrances are everywhere you, when you think about it, not just, not just in the sense of buying, buying fragrances to wear. 
Exercise two is then used to activate knowledge of how to approach reading a text like this. That's another form of world knowledge. It gets them to look at visible clues before they start reading. This is something they probably do outside class, but they might not transfer this skill to reading in their English class. So it's something that's really useful to activate as, as world knowledge to transfer these skills into, into their English classes. And in both activities, activating world knowledge helps students to focus on what comes next. And it maximizes their chances, in this case, of understanding a text. But if it was in a, re in a speaking class, it would maximize their chances of, of communicating taking the focus off content and onto, onto sort of deciding how to say things. Uh, 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 just one second. There you go. Activating personal experiences has a similar role in maximizing comprehension or communication. So, you know, imagine you're going to do a, a fairly sort of standard listening type, which would be a radio news program. It would help to have a leading activity like this one. We'll just wait for that to come up. It gets students talking about their contact with the radio. It also activates related vocabulary and their knowledge of a particular text type, radio news. Now, most course books include leading activities, at least in some places. Though for space reasons, they're sometimes in, tucked away in teachers' books. But as our examples show, they're easy to improvise. So um, I might well be preach preaching to the converted here. So could you just quickly tell me, how do you feel about using leading activities? Do you find you have time for them in your classes? Could you just put a quick yes into the box there if you, if you, if you do manage to find time to do that? Very important. Yes, I'm with you on that one. Lots of yeses there. Yes, always. Good. It's, it's surprising how, um, how when we're watching classes, how when, when, when they're not done, it's, it's very interesting to watch how students can get lost, especially students who find it harder to follow things. That's very positive. So leading, activa uh, leading activities activate knowledge and experiences, which in turn helps to engage students. We're going to look now at uh, different ways to engage your students at different times during the, during the class and uh, during activity sequences. And we've grouped our ideas into three categories, which you can see here. There are more categories, obviously, but we chose to focus on these three, on clear aims, on personalization, and on cognitive engagement. And let's start with clear aims. Clear aims help give a class direction and a sense of purpose. It also helps students to remember new language. We think if the lesson aim tells them what they're going to do with it, how it will help them to communicate. So to introduce a class on the past simple, for example, rather than say uh, this, which would be today we're going to study the past simple, it would perhaps make more sense and be more memorable for the students to say, you're going to learn to talk about completed events in the past, or maybe that's even too technical. You're going to learn to talk about things in the past, things from your weekend. And in skills lessons, like reading, listening, speaking, writing lessons, it helps if students know what sub-skill they're going to be learning. So they're always aware of what they're going to do to improve the way they listen and read, not just focusing on comprehension. Let's look at a couple of examples. If we go back to the radio news program, after doing the leading activity, which I'll just flick onto the screen again, Students could uh, listen and order topics in the news, which is what we did with, the, with our particular text. You could say now, can you listen and do exercise too? Well, that doesn't tell students what they're going to listen to or how you want them to listen to it. It would be more helpful, more supportive to say, you're going to listen to a radio news program now. As you listen, can you do exercise too? giving them some time to read the instructions, obviously. And then to do this exercise, you don't need to understand everything. I just want you to listen for key words to help you put the topics in the correct order. It takes, a, it takes longer, but it makes it clear to students that the aim is to get a general understanding of the text and to use key words to do that. Let's look at another example now. Let's look at this. This one's from a B1 level reading that we have about um, dangerous school journeys. Here it is. 
Um, and I hope that that's, uh, none of your school journeys are as dangerous as, as these particular ones are. There's a lead-in activity, as, as we were talking about before, um, which activates the topic and personal experiences. Uh, students then make predictions about where, the, where the, the kids in the pictures come from, and then they read to check their predictions. Now, again, they're, just, they're told that they just need to read enough to be able to check their predictions at this point. The, the, uh, may, the, the sort of detailed comprehension comes in, in the next activity. And then, finally, towards the bottom of the page, there's uh, exercise 4B, there's, there's, um, there's, a, there's an activity which helps students identify the reference of some of the referring words in the text. It's clear on the page that students still need to be told what referring words are and how recognising what they refer to will help them understand not only this text but also other texts that they read. They're learning a transferable skill. And we think this is a key point, is that, is that class aim should help students understand how what they're learning can be transferred to other situations in and outside the classroom. Another way of uh, engaging students is the regular use of personalization, you know, giving students the opportunity to react to material and relate or adapt it to their lives. The leading activities we looked at did this. And here are some other ideas that you can use at other stages during a lesson. The first one is just simply to get students to react to things. And I know this from my own teaching experience and from watching other teachers, that it's, it's sometimes easy to forget that uh, to give students the opportunity to express their reaction to the content of what they just read or listened to. But it's a great opportunity for some real communication, that real communication that, that pushes, their, pushes their level along. And as it plays as you know, the vital role in the learning process. So for example, after this uh, reading about sort of the scary school journeys, they have a lot to t they presumably have a lot to say, and uh, an activity like this would help them to to give them the uh, the space to to talk about their reactions, and the new st the new stories might have got them thinking as well. So an activity like this would help them to uh, to express what they felt about listening to the news stories and you know, relate the material to the news going on in their own lives or in, their own, in the world around them, their city, their country. But it's also a good idea to look out for uh, opportunities for, um, for personalization at any point in a class. In, in, in even the, apparently, the, the, the driest of classes, you can, you, can, you can find ways to personalize. So if you have an, a, a grammar activity like this, for example, is an example of a, of a of grammar activity. Students um, write sentences about. So students, write, students write sentences first, but a great way to personalise this would be to get them to first uh, make the sentences true for them, and then get them to write questions for each other using how often to compare their their, their personal sentences with each other. So. It's just an example of how an apparently um, dry activity can be used to, to generate a personal, a personal content and get students personally involved with material. And last on our list was cognitive engagement, getting students to notice and work things out for themselves, but also using material uh, and activities that get students thinking. Many textbooks encourage students to work out rules, but you can, you can improvise activities if your textbook doesn't. For example, course books today tend to focus on grammar that students have, have met previously um, in a reading or listening lesson. So you could find an example of a new structure used in context before starting um, a grammar lesson from your course book. Here's one from a, an example of a grammar contextualized from a, from a, a course book text. From from at an A2 level. So here it is. And I'd like you to um, just tell me what, what, um, what language do you think it's intended to um, contextualize? Any, any answers there? What is it? What? No, no. Going, going, gone. 
the idea is that it picks up that it, that it, um, that it includes zero conditional the zero conditional as, um, as, a, as, as, as language. So you could get students to focus on the meaning of the structure by asking questions about it. You know, is this, uh, is this always true or is this only true on this one occasion? To focus on form, you could uh, get students to complete one of the examples or you could get them to try and express the, uh, the rule to tell you how, how the particular language functions. Students could then check their ideas with the, uh, the, the reference in, the, in, the, in their grammar lesson, if that's what you go on to next. But these puzzles are also a good, um, a good example of, of, of an activity with some cognitive engagement because they, you know, they're, they're designed to make you think. So in a couple of minutes that we just have remaining, could I ask you, uh, do you know the answers to any of these puzzles? Could you could you zap in one, two, three, and uh, put any answers in you think you can you can work out? I don't seem to have cognitively engaged you. <laughs> no, no, nobody, nobody want to sort of see if they can. Uh, Give the answer to one of those one of those puzzles. I'm looking down at the chat box there. Okay, well if you, I'll give you the answer. If you are in a race and you overtake the person in second place, what place are you in? You're in second place. The second one is 21 because you double the first number and take away one, and the third one is short. If you add two letters to short to make shorter. Well, that's the end of uh, the second part of our webinar. I'm going to hand you over to Rebecca now, who will be talking about how you can challenge your students and get them to remember what they've learned. Hello, yes I am. So, are you there, Rebecca? <laughs> Okay, you. thanks then. Um, hello everyone, I hope you're enjoying the webinar so far. Um, just say if you can't hear me at all, I, I can hear the voices going a bit squeaky sometimes, so I hope that's okay. Alright, um, in this section now then we're going to move on to looking at challenge and consolidation. So how you can help your students to really make the most of their learning experience through challenging them to do better and consolidating their language. So the first section we're going to focus on is using review and feedback to set personal goals and improve language performance. And then we're going to look at using additional resources to consolidate and practice language. So let's first look at the role of review and feedback. As you know, the more often language is reviewed and recycled, the better it will be retained by students. Can I ask you, are any of you familiar with the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve? Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. Okay, some of you saying yes, um, most of you aren't familiar with it. Okay, here it is. Um, Herman Ebbinghaus spotted this curve on the basis of his own learning experiments in the late 19th century. If you look at the red curve, um, let me see if I can show you, that's this one here. Uh, you can see that he found if knowledge isn't reviewed, it's forgotten very quickly with 50% being forgotten after the very first day. That's here. However, he also found that if material is reviewed and recycled at certain points in time after learning, then it's possible to retain about 90% of what has been learned. So this is represented here by the green line, the learning curve. And what is important here is the spacing of the review. 
So the first crucial review of material needs to take place here. So within 24 hours of learning. And the next reviews fairly quickly afterwards if you want your students to remember uh, what they've learned. So I can see a lot of comments here about the audio. I'll try and adjust my microphone to see if that's any better. OK, so in a good course book, um, there should be lots of inbuilt recycling within a unit. Um, but it's imperative that you make sure that students review material as soon as possible by giving them homework. And also by reviewing new language the next day at the start of the lesson by using the sort of warmers that Rob was talking about earlier. Obviously, your course book can help you out with unit reviews. Uh, most course books have these. So the sort of reviews where students do exercises at the end of the unit in order to see how much they've remembered of the unit language. Um, this one's an example from beyond A2+. You won't be able to read it. But you'll see that we cover vocabulary, uh, lexical sets presented in the unit, as well as grammar and transferable skills. So all the things that link back to the aims of the unit. We think these sort of reviews are best done by students on their own and then self-checked. So it's not just enough for students to do the exercise and say, hey, great, I got 35 out of 50 or whatever it is, uh, and then move on. What they really need to do is look at the areas they did well in or didn't do well in. So is it vocabulary was OK, maybe, but the structures weren't too good? Uh, did your students maybe have problems with a certain skill? Um, if they can look at those areas that they didn't do well in, note them, go back, revise those sections again, uh, it will really help them to improve their language. And then a week or so later, you can ask your students to do the review or progress check again, and they should notice an increase in their score. Most course books also have uh, progress checks. Uh, this one's an example as well, again, from A2+. Um, these are where you review language from a couple of units, um, where language is, is bundled. You have lots of different tenses, lots of different vocabulary together. So the student's reviewing everything that they've done so far. Uh, somebody says this looks like a cat test. You're right. We've based a lot of these on, on exam style. Um, tests. In these ones, uh, students are reviewing skills, so reading, listening, writing. Um, you probably do these kinds of checks in class, mark any writing tasks, but the principle is basically the same. If you find that students are having problems with a particular skill, whether it's listening or reading, then um, you can challenge them to do something about it, to do more listening to go back and read the text again, and to maybe take the test a week or so later. Another way to challenge your students to do better is to ask them to give each other feedback, to use peer assessment. Now, how many of you actually use peer assessment in your class? Great, lots of you do. Somebody says it's important to be honest, definitely. Definitely in the writing lessons, you sometimes use it. OK, so a lot of you are using this. Um, we think any time you, your students do an oral presentation, uh, act out dialogues that they've prepared, um, it's always a good idea to ask them to get another pair or another group to give them feedback on what they've just done. And then if you have time, you can get your students to do the same thing again, uh, taking into account the feedback that they've just been given. Before you actually start using peer assessment in class, it's a good idea to give them some rules uh, for when they give, give feedback. So in another webinar on life skills, um, which you can access at the Macmillan site, we talked about how important it is to develop self-confidence. And obviously, peer assessment is also an area where we want students to feel they're getting positive, constructive advice 
and not being criticised unfairly. If you look at these rules here, this is just an example of some rules which I found on the website of um, a secondary school in the north of England where they were being used for maths classes actually. And I think that's a great way to, to remember feedback, especially for younger students. Um, they were talking about fishing, which is actually quite nice. Um, what you can do is get your students to make to make up their own rules. You can give them their rules, ask them to design a poster. Uh, you could even use these if you wanted. Put them on the wall and get students to refer to them every time they give feedback, just to make sure that they're being constructive and fair. If you look here, it says uh, you want your feedback to be uh, specific. Okay, so how can you do this? Well, you can use lots of different types of feedback forms. Um, I'm sure that you have different types of feedback forms that you do. They need to be specific to your aims of what you want to achieve in the class, obviously. Um, you can use smileys, especially if you've got younger learners. Please um, get your students to just write, uh, draw a smiley in the box. You can get them to use adjectives such as fantastic, good, okay, not so good. Or you can get them to use a number on a scale. Um, the important thing is whatever scale you use, whether you use smileys, adjectives, um, Use a four-point scale rather than a five-point scale. You don't want students saying something's really terrible or really horrible. Okay, so, so the worst that they should be able to say is it's not so good. Okay, to keep, to keep up the confidence of your students. Another type of form that you can use with um, more advanced students, you can use multiple choice and then give them the chance to add extra comments. Um, or maybe just questions that they have for the writer. This is one that we developed for B1+. Plus. Okay, so it's for, for higher level students. For higher level students, you could also use just a blank form, something like this. This is um, two stars and a wish. This is an example um, of a type of form where students can simply write two things that they thought was good. So they're the two stars. You know, what did you like? Did you like the fact that it was interesting, the pictures, uh, the language that was used? They can focus on anything that you think is important. And the final section is the things that they thought were lacking or something that they, they would wish to be included next time in a presentation, for example. Okay, so that's a more open form of peer assessment. Um, to finish this part on reviewing, before we go on to the resources, um, let's look at correction of written work. Now, when you mark written work, how do, how do you do it? Uh, do you have some sort of system for um, helping your students uh, to correct their own mistakes? Do you correct all the mistakes for them? Okay, so some of you use a correction code. Yeah, excellent. Most of you do. Yeah, okay, so you're, most of you are using correction codes. Whether it's a green pen or a red pen, it <laughs> doesn't really make any difference. Great, okay. So what type of things do you focus on then? What sort of, uh, when you use your correction code, what sort of corrections do you do? Do you use abbreviations? Okay, you use corrections for meaning. Okay, yeah, some of you abbreviations, you underline the mistakes, okay, and then get students to correct them. Right. Great. Okay. Right, I'm going to show you an example here. Um, this, is, this is actually from my son's English class. He's 11, um, and I'm afraid he's got terrible handwriting, so I hope you can read it. Um, and it's a story about a, a parrot that's flown away from its owner. And I, I thought when I read this, I thought the content is actually really nice. Um, but the mistakes that he tends to make are spelling, which I've abbreviated here with SP, 
and um, punctuation, which is SP. And the other big mistake or uh, thing that's not so good is at the beginning he's got uh, a tense mistake. He starts in the present and goes into the past. Now, I've only put these uh, abbreviations here so that you can see what sort of mistakes they're making. If I were marking this, I wouldn't actually write all these mistakes here because it's a, a few of you are saying it's negative marking, okay? And it, that, that's really um, not a positive way to encourage and motivate your students. Um, what I noticed from this is the categories of things that are wrong, okay? So if you were marking this, then you could just choose to say, make one general comment about you could do more on your spelling, uh, for example, okay? Uh, and then get, get your students to go back and, and rewrite the misspelled words or rewrite uh, the, the structure again with punctuation. You could also choose to not focus on mistakes at all and just focus on the content and say, this is a really nice story, great, well done. Um, or you could simply focus on any sort of mistakes that uh, would lead to the, the written work not being understood. So it's, it's really important what you want to focus on. Do you want to focus on the content mainly? Do you want to focus on certain areas? Okay, so think about what the aim is for you in giving this written work when you actually do the corrections. Okay, I'm conscious that time is ticking, so we're going to move on to the next area um, and look at some ways in that you can use uh, additional resources to help students in your class to push themselves to do better. Now, one way um, that you can help them do this is by using projects. Now, I'm presuming that you all do use uh, projects in your classes. Some course books will have them in the actual course book. Some others will have them on the website or in the teacher's book. Yes, you're all saying you use projects. Excellent. Yeah. So this one here is an example from beyond. Um, this is 80 plus. OK, and here we just give some suggestions for projects that you could use after every second unit. Um, you've probably not got time to do five a year, but if you did, then you could do all five, or you could just get your students to choose one or two that look interesting for them. The important thing is that students are going to need lots of guidance and scaffolding um, to help them get started on projects. So um, it's really important that you give them that scaffolding to help them start off and structure their project. So this is an example that we have for Beyond. We have some step-by-step uh, step -step guidelines on the website for the projects. Um, and we have things like we give students an introduction to the topic to explain what sort of um, text type they're dealing with. Um, there are step-by-step -step instructions like this. There are examples of things that students could write. And there also there's also language help. Uh, to help students communicate in English with each other while they're doing the project. So if your course book doesn't have this, then it's quite easy for you to put things like this together. Okay, moving on to another type of uh, free writing that you could do to challenge your students. How many of you actually use journals or diaries in your class? In English, of course. Yeah, quite uh, quite mixed. Yeah, it's a really good idea to get students to keep a diary uh, or a journal in English. Um, this could be over the summer holidays where they write what they do or about everyday events in the school week. Um, you can tailor it to certain language areas. So if you're doing food and health, you could get your students to write what they eat. Obviously, be careful uh, if you've got a class of teenage girls. Um, or you could, if you're doing clothes, you could get your students to write, to write what they wear every day, um, particularly at the weekends. Okay, but the main purpose here is that students recycle language that they've learned 
and that they just get used to simply writing in English. Um, personally, I think journals uh, should be done individually and just done for student size um, so that they just read them themselves. And unless a student volunteers to read something out or, or to show a partner, um, but, but you might see that differently. Um, basically, up to you, depending on the size, the sort of information that your students are writing in journals. A lot of you say that you have too much to do, but this is something really that you can ask students to do on their own at home. But it's not something that you need to correct or, or look at in any way. Right, what about web tools? Do you use web tools? Um, get your students to go on the internet and do guided writing. Yep, lots of you do. Right, I'm, I'm sure that you have your favorite tools. I'm just going to show you a couple of mine very quickly. Um, this is Globster, which I, I really like because students can use lots of design ele elements. They can add in audio, video, okay, to make their own electronic posters. And you can use it with any type of text or topic. Another one of my favorites is uh, Storybird. This is really good uh, for writing stories. It starts by the student choosing artwork. So if they don't have any ideas, then they can actually you know, just look at the artwork. And they can build a story around the artwork that's already there. So they don't need to be super creative um, if they don't want to. And they can make it look like a real book so that readers can uh, turn the pages. OK, and uh, you've got the, the link there at the top. OK, and you'll be able to see those later, obviously, on the website. So the last idea, because I think our time's nearly up, the last idea that I want to uh, mention is using graded readers for reading for pleasure. So do you actually use graded readers as well? And um, if you use them, do you use them in class or do you use them at home? Yeah, some of you are saying they're expensive. Like, yes, yes, I know they're expensive. Um, yeah, both. Um, both, okay. Um, any sort of extensive reading that students can do will help to consolidate what they've learned and expand their language. So if your school does have the financial resources, do make graded readers available to your students for the correct level. In Beyond, we have some extracts from graded readers, um, which will also hopefully encourage students to go on and read the book um, in their own time at home. OK, so that was a quick gallop through a few ideas. So I'm going to summarize what we've talked about today. So Robert talked about ideas for the first classes of the new academic year. Rob talked about some ideas to engage and activate your students throughout the year. And I've just whipped through a couple of ideas to challenge your students using review and additional resources. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we do have a couple of minutes. So uh, if you have any questions, then please just type them into the box. And Robert, Rob, and myself um, will try and answer them. Yeah, as Rebecca okay, remember was saying, that, just um, please the write any questions you have will be available in, into the chat box, and uh, we can answer them that way. Thanks, guys. We'll.
Oh, I'm seeing a few questions come in, uh, which I'll try and put to our hosts quickly. Uh, so, uh, Irina is asking uh, what materials come with Beyond. Uh, so whether there's a teacher's book, workbook, or online workbook. Um, yeah, for those of you asking about the certificate and the recording, uh, you'll be emailed the certificate and the recording uh, will be published on the website shortly. Um, okay, no questions. I'm sharing the Beyond website in the chat box now which, Irina, that should help answer your question. Uh, you can visit that in your own time. Um, Yes, if Rebecca's still there, she's probably the, the best person to answer that. I see there are, there are quite a few questions about beyond how many levels there are. And uh, so beyond is, is a six level course. It goes from A1 plus up to B2. Uh, at the moment, A2 plus and B1 are the two levels that are available. And the other levels will be available from uh, the beginning of next year, spring next year. Uh, if you do visit the website, you'll see all the information and uh, you can download a sample unit as well to, to have a look at it in more, more detail. So um, on behalf of the three of us, I'd just like to say thank you again. And uh, we'll be hopefully we'll be back for another webinar before too long. Thank you all. Thank you very much for for, for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Okay. Take care. Bye. Hello everyone, and this is Henry and not Robert. I've just had to hop onto his computer because there were some problems with mine. Um, I just wanted to say a final goodbye to everyone who came today and thank you all again for uh, joining us today for this webinar. Um, just a quick reminder, the recording and the slides are going to be available from the Macmillan English website shortly, so I would expect by tomorrow at the latest. And we will email you all with your certificates if you registered to attend, uh, hopefully tomorrow as well, so don't worry. So what I'm going to do now is just close down the webinar and exit out of the room. If you have um, any questions, then please use the email address that was sent to you in the confirmation email when you registered and we'll uh, aim to reply as soon as possible. So uh, once again, thank you and we wish you all the best for uh, the new term uh, this year.